Hi, everyone. This is Bill Holden from Field Trial Central, and this is Field Trial Central Live. Uh, tonight, we are uh, really lucky to be joined by Rich Robertson out of Idaho. Uh, you know, what? one thing I guess I always like to point out is this is being streamed live on Facebook, also on YouTube. Uh, we'll also be hosted here for, you know, for all time. So make sure uh, you share this to your friends and family and and bird dog friends and and, and get this type of information spread out to the world. I think this is, these discussions have been a lot of fun. They're informative. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of people would find them that way. So uh, feel free to make some comments or questions uh, down below, and we will uh, try to address some of them as the, as the show goes on uh, tonight. Uh, Rich uh, is coming to us from Idaho. Like I said, uh, obviously there's not a lot of introduction that needs to be said. Rich has been around the field trial game for a really, really long time. Well, not really long. That sounds like you're old, but, but just quite a while. And, uh, you know, kind of a, kind of a two career deal, right? He, Richie for a long time was running, uh, setters and pointers on the all age circuit, uh, traveling the country you know, with really some of the top dogs in the country, some of the top dogs in the history of, of the sport. Uh, you know, at least, you know, he's got, you know, two, two dogs that Richie handled that are in the hall of fame Tacoma Mountain on sunrise and Hicks rising sun, uh, two of the greatest setters of all time. And actually, I guess sunrise would be the greatest setter of all time. And, and when it comes to, you know, winning and breeding and, and producing, uh, I don't know how it, something that would be hard to be uh, argued. So, uh, Rich, I really, uh, and then, and then I guess, you know, we'll, we'll say then today, uh, now Richie's, uh, running, uh, German Shorter Pointers, uh, for, uh, the Richardsons and being really successful in that. So this is, uh, going to be a, a, an opportunity for us to talk to him about uh, both the past and, and the, you know, and the present. So, uh, Richie, thanks for joining us tonight. And, uh, we look forward to hearing a lot of great stories. How's it going out there in Idaho? Good, good, very good. Good, good. So let's really let's just looking forward to the interview tonight. Yeah, it'll be fun. Let's 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 kind of start, you know, at, at the beginning a little bit. Tell me how you got started in in bird dogs, uh, and how you got started in field trialing in in particular, and and just kind of work us, you know, kind of through that story for a little bit. Well, unlike. A lot of people, I've been fortunate to grow up in the bird dog world. I'm second generation, been to field trials my whole entire life. I remember going to them when we were just little tiny kids. And uh, so my dad was big into it. And uh, that's how we get a start. I was running dogs in trials when I was 10, 11, 12 years old. So that's the beginning of my time of field trialing. And done it my whole life, <clears throat> except for just a short time when I graduated from high school. I decided I'd try something else, and that lasted about a year, and I came back to the bird dogs and been there ever since. That so, seems like I mean that's uh, I guess I've been fortunate. Yep. Well, it seems like a good decision. Uh, yeah, so, it, it was a great decision. I, I mean, I got to meet a lot of good people and see a lot of good dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, no, there's no doubt about that. So let's go back. So you got you, you know, obviously uh, your dad, Rich Sr. was a uh, professional bird dog trainer. Then you ended up in that game also. Uh, and you ran, uh, obviously, on the West Coast, you run a lot of shooting dog stakes and all age stakes at the time. But probably, uh, I guess we would we would say spent most of the time as an all age handler, correct? Correct. Yeah. I, uh, so how I started my own pro career was that my dad. I was scouting for my dad, and I was about twenty two years old. My dad had some health problems, and he was uh, wasn't able to trial like he did before, and he was only on the West coast. So at 23, I said, I took over the string of dogs and I said, I don't want to do just the West coast. I want to do everywhere. So at 23 years old, 
I headed for the deep south and I started trialing down there. I was going to the prairies. And so it was an education at 23 years old, didn't have a lot of money. Uh, and I had clients that were skeptical about me going south. And uh, a lot of them said, you can't win down there. I said, you're right. If you don't go, you can't win. I said, but if you go enough, you will win. And it took me a couple of years and I finally won down there. And, and then from there on, I kept going. And I'm one of the few trainers, I believe, that travel from west to east and north to south. And I lived nine months out of the year on the road. And, uh, and that's how I got my education. I got to be around a lot of different dog trainers that were great dog trainers and uh, they were good mentors. And uh, I can say that I learned from everybody. And if you have your eyes and your ears open, you will learn from everybody and put it into your program and make a great program. Yeah, you do. You learn just a little bit from each, each person, take, take some good stuff with, uh, from all the different trainers and, and, and actually probably from all the different dogs that you put your hands on over the years, right? You, you learn something from all of them. That's right. That's right. I mean, a dog will teach you things if you let him teach you stuff that you will use to make a better dog the next time and make a better dog out of him also. Yep. Yep. I believe that. So, uh, tell me who was the, you know, your first big winner, uh, when you started traveling around and, and, and hitting the big trials. Well, my first big winner in the South was to go mountain sunrise. And I won the Pelican at down in Mississippi. And, uh, I flew in there and rented the car and went to the trial. And Calvin Davis helped me with the dog and uh, he did a good job and everybody thought I was a laughing joke. And they was like, so how, how'd he do Calvin? Calvin said, well, he said, I think we're running for second place. <laughs> and they all laughed when it, was all, when it was all said and done, he won it. <laughs> and that was my first big win in the South. And, and you know, and then I start winning a little more. Sunrise also run one in the South at the Continental, correct? Correct. He was runner up. In the oh, he's runner up at the Continental. Okay. Yeah. Tell yeah, me about that, that. About that trip. Was that correct. one of your early trips to Dixie? That was, like I said. Uh, I was, it would have been about 19, it was before sunrise when I started going to the continental. So okay. I ran sunrises grand dam and his dam and to call Mount Nikki, which was a litter mate to sunrises dam. Those dogs were my first setters of that line that I ran at the continental. And then a little few years later, sunrise come along and then I was runner up with him there at the continental. Okay. I think it was, I, I think it was the next year after I won the Pelican, I believe. Okay. Wow. That, yeah. Yeah. That had to have uh, opened up some eyes when you, when you end up coming all the way from the Northwest and, and uh, get down there in the, in the deep South and, and winning with a setter. I, I, it seemed to me back in those, in those days, there wasn't a lot of setters running in the all age circuit. Uh, so that was something that, uh, yeah, I had to really, you know, kind of put your name on the map. Yeah. I, I mean, I took a lot of flack from people running setters, like you're going to starve to death. And, and I laughed, you know, and I had some good comments from different people and, and, uh, so it was fun to watch the comments come to me and then me make a name for myself. And then those comments went away, you know, and then they knew that the line of setters I had were real all age dogs and can compete against anybody. And, yeah. and, and their record proved it, you know, 
you know, I had, and then Hicks Rise and Sun came along behind Sunrise, which he was only a year and a half younger than Sunrise. I, that was the first litter that Sunrise sired was Hicks Rise and Sun and Skid Row Joe and uh, those dogs. And so Hicks Rise and Sun lived in the shadow of his sire. And there was times that I thought he maybe had beat his sire, but it didn't happen. But, you know, Hicks Rising Sun went on to become improved himself. He's in the Hall of Fame. Yep. Uh, I won the Mississippi Championship with Hicks Rising Sun at the Huffman Place at yep. Will Farm. And uh, when I I'd ran him, Larry Huffman helped me with him. And uh, so I had to get on a plane and fly home. And at that time, they posted top dogs. Well, I was the top dog when I left. And everybody said, are you leaving? I said, well, yeah, I'm leaving. I said, I got to be another trial in California. And they said, well, you're sitting on top. I said, well, if it's meant to be, it will be. And you got to trust the judges. So I left. And Piper called me the next day. She says, you're still on top. And she kept me updated. And when it was all said and done, I won it with him. You know, oh. so when you put in a good performance, it's going to stand. Yep. Yep. That's awesome. So, so and, tell me, tell me a little bit about the differences or, or similarities maybe of, of sunrise and, uh, Hicks rising sun, uh, and there's some other great ones in there too. Desert Rambler, uh, Skid Row Joe. Desert Rambler. Yeah. Brick Church Sundrop. So, I mean, yeah, it just Sundrop. goes on and on. Tommy B. Tommy B, another one. Tommy yep. B, Mona's Delight. Yeah. And actually, like Southwind Mike was a son of Hicks Rising Sun. Yep. And that was a gift. That was a gift to Travis Hicks that owned Hicks Rising Sun. I give it to Travis. For him allowing me to, I, that's where I stayed the winters was at his place in Tennessee. So that was a gift. That's how Southwind Mike came about. Okay. Know, so it goes on and on and on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we've talked before that, yeah, you look at setter pedigrees today and, and, uh, you, you know, you go back, you know, they're just, it's hard to find one that doesn't, isn't built upon some of those bloodlines. Uh, I think Sunrise you know, right. rightfully so, so, I guess, was probably the, the most bred of the bunch. Um, but if if there was no, you know, if if Sunrise wasn't able to breed, you know, Hicks Rising Sun would have, would have uh, you know, Buster would have got a lot more breeding and you probably would have seen a lot more, you know, coming out of him too. But, but correct. Um, if correct. I, if I remember, I don't remember the numbers, you know, Sunrise said, you know, obviously, was a 15 time champion or, or so. And, and produced, uh, I don't close to 300 winners. If I would, if I remember right. Um, with a lot of wins, obviously in those, but yeah. Um, yeah. I probably used to remember well, the numbers off the top of my head, but. Right. Me too. <laughs> but time has gone by, but yep. you know, he, uh, he produced, all age dogs at a high level and shooting dogs at a high level. And, uh, so, I mean, he was good for both shooting dogs and all age, you know, and, yeah. uh, I don't think his production record in the all age world will probably ever be beat the number of all age dogs that he has produced and the number of championships they have won themselves. So, uh, it says a lot about him, but you know, <laughs> He was a, he passed that trait on in his puppies, you know, easy to handle, find birds and want to do things for you. You asked the question that I've been asked a million times about what's the difference between Hicks Rising Sun and Tacoma Mountain Sunrise. And uh, they were both great dogs. The difference was Sunrise was brought on. And he was one of those dogs that was really easy all the way from a puppy and paid attention to what you wanted and was easy to break 
loved birds and uh he had a great memory he never ever forgot any place he ever ran where he pointed birds you could go back a couple of years later run the same course he'd go to the exact same spot he found birds a couple of years prior and he just had that and like i told people he always give 110 percent he i mean he always was out there to help you hicks rides the sun the difference in him he had he was a little more what i call a little hotter engine he you know you kind of had to work him down a little bit to get him to focus you know but that was good and he could take it then through his career he left my hands for a little while from and i developed him all the way from a puppy all the way through his first year as a broke dog and then he left my hands for a few years before i got my hands back on him and then he came on and went on to prove himself also so i tell people who's to say what he could have been had he not maybe left my hands for that little bit of time and not that anything was wrong but i mean as like in everybody's program they changing programs sometimes in the middle of a dog's life is a little hard you know and, right. and Absolutely. not that they don't go on and win but they miss a little time so to me that's a, and, and you know hicks riding sun is produced himself and passed on in good traits. Yep. And uh, so, I, you know, I think that maybe hopefully answered your question a little bit. Yeah. The I, I, between the two. Yeah. I thought I remembered that, that you had talked that way before that, that uh, Hicks rising sun was, was a, uh, you know, a little bit more, you know, a little more, I don't know if I, you even say a little more powerful, but maybe a little more self-employed uh, like uh, Randy Anderson had said recently, cool. you know, and, and, uh, you know, and, you know, sunrise, you know, I guess it, you know, it's funny when you mentioned that, but that's just, you know, when we talk about this, this is, it's, it's no secret, but, uh, every time that I've had a, a trainer or owner or handler on, and we've talked about some of the great dogs that they've had and you know, what, what made them stand out. And, and it's, it's things like that, that you discussed, right. That, uh, you know, a real mark of intelligence, you know, that that's, and it just makes everything so much easier, right? It makes it easier for them to help you and you to help them. And, and they, uh, they learn and they, uh, you know, move forward. And it's really, uh, and I think that's, you know, with, with sunrise, what you're kind of describing there. Right. I mean, like the year he won the mid America championship, uh, out in Kansas, uh, we wouldn't find a lot of birds. We, it was all wild birds, but we was find a few. And Fred DeLeo and I had rode out of camp one day to catch back up on the course. And we rode up a covey of quail. It was kind of a little bit off the course, but that was the course I had with Sunrise. And I told Fred and I were helping each other. And I told Fred, I says, I'm going to point them birds with Jack and he laughed. I said, no, I'm going to point him. So it came when I had to run him and I told Fred, I said, now I'm going to send him there. He'll go. He'll go to wherever I send him. Fred chuckled. So we turned loose and it was probably 10 minutes off a of breakaway. And I turned my horse and Jack looked up, saw which way my horse was going. And I went to blow on the whistle and he went all the way up in there. I couldn't see him. We watched him fade out of sight, but I didn't see him come on. So I called point. And everybody's like, thought I had lost my mind because you couldn't see no, no dog. And so I we start riding that way. And as we start going that way, you could make a dog out barely. And Fred is already now calling point because he's way up there where you can see. And so we ride all the way up there and I flushed a covey of birds. And so it went on. He run an hour and a half. We ended up setting good. Well, when it was all said and nope, done with the trial, John Criswell said to me, because it was his trial, he says, I know you didn't see that dog pointed. So how did you know he was pointed up there? And I just chuckled. 
<laughs> and John <laughs> just laughed. He says, I know there's a, something behind this. <laughs> and, uh-huh. but that was the kind of dog he was. I mean, that, that's how intelligent he was. And uh, you could do anything you wanted to do with him. And that's why those dogs win so much. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't care. That's what you should be breeding for in any breed of dogs. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah, that's great. Hey, we had a I had a question from Jet Farabee, and he asked, uh, at what yep. point or age did you know Sunrise was special? Probably when he was like six to eight months old. He just you could see it in. And he, he was a dog that when you walked around him, his eyes always followed you. He knew, he knew he would read you. And when you see that in a dog, you know, that dog's willing to help you. Yeah. And, and that's just the way he was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can believe that. Yeah. I had another good question. Someone, uh, Joey Smith says he'd like to hear stories of the differences uh, with Rapidin and Audubon. Uh, tell me a little bit about those dogs. Well, Rapidan, he was about three years old when I got my hands on him. And the Tracys had had him when he was a derby and had started him and had him come along really good. And then the McConnells brought him to me. And, uh, but he, you know, he wasn't finished. He was started well, but he wasn't finished. So they brought him out. And they brought Audubon out, which was a puppy. And they were a couple years different in age. And Mary said about Audie, she says, I don't think he's going to make a dog. But I brought him along anyways, just to turn him loose out here and let him see. So I said, okay. So we turned him loose. And he started Audubon and he started out through there. Pretty soon he's into birds. Pretty soon he's running bigger and bigger and bigger. And then we turned Rapidan loose and Rapidan just lit out of the country right off the get go. And I mean, went way in there. Mary says, you going to go get him? I said, no, he's going to come back and find me. I said, I'm not going looking for him. She panicked, but he finally, he came back and looked for me. So the two back to like sunrise and Hicks rising sun, Rapidan was like Hicks Rising Sun. He was a little more with a bigger motor and geared up. Yeah. And but you had to work him a little harder than you did Autobahn. Autobahn mm-hmm. was a lot like Sunrise. He was a more laid back and built on through his career like Sunrise. And uh, Autobahn, I raised him, so he bonded with me you know, from a puppy and we had that bond and Rapidan had a bond with me, but not like the bond I had with Autobahn. And that was a difference of raising them, but they were both phenomenal bird dogs, great bird dogs could run the country. I don't care if it was in the piney woods or the prairies and, uh, Audubon at the continental, he made the call back there one year and, uh, I ran him in the callback and I can't remember. He had, I think it was five or six lines in the callback and just not in the callback in the, uh, qualifying okay. and then came back and call callback and had some more, but he, uh, he was just a great bird dog and could run that front end and, and stay with you. And Rapidan also, I mean, Rapidan was probably more built for like the prairies. Where Audubon was more built, he'd run the prairies, but he was more comfortable in edge country in Piney Woods. That's where he was more comfortable at. But the big open vast land, Rapidan loved. He loved that kind of country. Yeah. Well, that's great. Those are yeah, that's great stories. Um, so we're going to talk about setters a little bit more and then we'll move on to some of the great pointers you ran and then we'll, we'll kind of work our way towards uh, the short hairs. But so tell me about some of the other setters that you saw 
and maybe you know that you didn't run right and you know that a lot of them came uh went back to sunrise or went back to to hicks rising sun or or some of those other great dogs there's there's got to be some other ones that you saw run uh throughout the country uh that that stood out maybe give me some thoughts on some of those well i had a a setter female during the time when sunrise was young and her name was uh called miss mona miss mona was a shooting dog that i won mm, i don't know i think five championships with her she was a full litter mate to grand door that harold ray ran and so she got bred to sunrise and that's what produced desert rambler okay but she was a phenomenal dog she also was bred to lookout mickey which produced lookout mona that produced tommy b T's gun runner, all those dogs. But she was unbelievable. She was fun. She was, I could hunt her and Sunrise together. And those two dogs worked so good together as a team. And and they were fun. And she was just phenomenal. I mean, I, I she died at an early age. She got a twisted stomach. And uh, we lost her when she was probably about six years old. And uh, so she was phenomenal. And like I said, she was a Smith bred setter and I loved her and it worked, you know, the cross with that and sunrise worked well, Yeah. you know, so, you know, I saw that and, uh, but also, you know, growing up as young, my dad had setters. And so I've seen setters my whole entire life that, from the old bloodlines, you know, and, uh, but today's setters are different than them, you know, so I've seen a lot of great setters. I saw Bozan Mosley and he was a nice dog. I mean, I seen him do some good jobs. I seen shadow Bo do some good jobs. Uh, so, I mean, there's different setters out there, but I still are very fond of my Tacoma mountain line. I think they still produce, some of the top bird dogs in the country. Yeah. And I still have a couple of direct descendants of sunrise in my kennel still that I'm breeding still today. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's, that's something. So you are still breeding setters, right? Still breeding a few pointers. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, uh, uh I, I may, be, I may be running another breed, but I still have a love for the setters and the pointers. So. Yep, I, I can. That's that'd be hard to get rid of. Uh, I had a question come up. I'm going to say it now before I it 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 goes away from me thinking about it. But Keith Heckham uh, had a question. How did you go about working and preparing the Western dogs uh, for Ames? And I would guess that that would say the same as if you're going to Ames or you're going to uh, Doctor Huffman's or you're going to the going to Dixie but Ames maybe more so because it's, you know, a little slower pace and a little tighter grounds, but. Correct. Well, you know, the thing is I committed early on in my life to win in the South. So that meant taking puppies down there when they were little in the winter and having training grounds to train on down South and develop those puppies early on. And the good ones will remember that. And, you know, so it's not just a short term. Right. It takes several years to acclimate them dogs to that country. And you got to have the grounds and a place to train. And uh, I was fortunate to have some good places to train dogs. And that's, you know, you have to work in that country, prepare, prepare the dog for the aims. I mean, there's no, you can work in the Piney Woods and you can get them right in there, but I still think that edge country has a little different than the piney woods, you know, getting the dog ready for it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and obviously, uh, we would don't want to, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the, you know, the great job that sunrise did at, at the national championship. And was that in 19, it seems to me it was 90, but that might be wrong. Um, uh, 
<laughs> Brad Hart. Be, it was the year that Dunn's year Fearless that, Bud. Yeah, Dunn's Fearless Bud won. But yeah, I, and that's, you know, obviously Brad Hart got, got a, you know, he, he really, you know, a real good representation of what Sunrise did in, in that three hours. And uh, that was, you know, really knocked on the door there. I, I would, I would think that was one that felt pretty right. good. As I mean, felt good as it was going along. Probably didn't feel good at the end, but, <laughs> but, but uh, that you knew you were doing a good job. Right, and Hicks Rise and Sun put in a good performance there at Thames, also. Okay. So. Yep. And uh, he had a good job there, but I mean, it's a tough place to win. But you know, like I always tell people, if you go there and finish the three hours and do a good job. Even if you don't win, be happy with your dog because there's not many dogs that can do that. And so yeah. at the end of the day, he's a winner in your heart. He don't may not be the winner of the judges, but he's a winner in your heart. And that's what you need to look for. Well, one thing that we probably should talk about is obviously uh, Sunrise was able to you know, run and, and ran, you know, big country, you know, out West ran uh, in the Southeast and, and, and did the three hour stint at Ames, you know, very admirably. Uh, but you had no problem taking him foot hunting, did you? No, no. And I was, a, I'm always been a big believer in field. If you cannot take a field trial dog and foot hunt him and shoot birds over him, I don't care what breed it is you're breeding for the dog to me. I mean, that's just, you should the hunt, foot hunt, and field trial your dogs. That's me personally. A lot of people probably won't agree, but I want a dog, my own field trial dogs that I could hunt. And all my field trial dogs, setters or pointers, I could foot hunt. And, you know, I ran on the ranch here for quite a few years. I ran a commercial hunting operation. And every one of my field trial dogs was my guide dogs. And I, when they reached a certain point, I would let them retrieve the birds back to me. And I'd send them for the retrieve. Yep. And, uh, and that's what you should be breeding for. Yep. No, I, yeah, obviously. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's good stuff. I know that uh, I've obviously had my hands on a pretty fair number of, of uh, sunrise bred dogs over the years. Uh, and you know, that was our experience, right? They were dogs that we could field trial. Uh, you could run them in a, you know, you know, walking trial or a grouse trial or a horseback shooting dog steak, um, an all age steak. And they all, you know, they, they just, you know, went to bird hunting and you could, and you could also take those dogs and, you know, and hunt over them. You know, my kids grew up hunting over, you know, dogs like that, you know, so. Uh, I, I believe that's important. And, and, and those are the, most of those dogs retrieved girl naturally, not that we spent a whole lot of time working on it, but, but they did it, you know, they did, if you shot birds for them, they'd go get them. So, uh, yeah, I right. think those are, those are important things to remember when we're putting dogs together. Right. Sunrise himself, because I hunted him so much, he'd retrieved a hand every time. So if you, if you didn't hit the bird and it didn't fold, he'd stand there. But if that you hit that bird and it folded, he was leaving there. And it was no big deal. I mean, I didn't have to worry about it in trial because we didn't shoot him. You know? And uh, that, to me, is what you should be looking for. Yeah. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. So tell us, some, tell us a little bit on the pointer side. So obviously you won with a, a fair number of different pointers. Um, and some of those dogs are breeding on today and have uh, a lot of influence on the dogs that we're seeing winning on the, on, on the all age circuit today. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've ran porters my whole entire life along with the setters. In fact, what's well, kind of funny when I came along and won with the setters, I couldn't get a pointer because everybody thought all I worked was setters. I said, no, I work anything. So then I just, start breeding some of my own pointers and getting some stuff together and started building my all age pointer string again. And so probably the most recent famous pointer dog is Riverton's fun sinking scooter. 
and he was a phenomenal dog. And uh, so his mother was a, a great trial dog too. I got her when she was like four, and a, four years old in her career and uh, brought her along, got her broke and won with her uh, qualifier for Ames. She you know, was just a nice dog. And so Fred DeLeo and I were very good friends and I'd helped him a bunch over the years. So I helped him that year that he won with Fun Seekers Rebel. And so I told Fred, I said, and this was before he won, I told Fred, I said, I want to breed Riverton's Black Eyed Pea to Fun Seeker Rebel. He said, perfect, because Fred loved her. And uh, Fred says, I'll take a puppy. I said, not a problem. So we made the mating, and then that's what produced Riverton's Fun Seeking Scooter, Youngstown Thrill Seeker, Rebels Debutante. All three of those dogs were out of the same litter, and they all competed and won on the major circuit. Now, Scooter himself has produced and bred to a female that Tracy Ames had that produced uh, just a resistible, fun seeking hitman. And then those dogs himself has produced on. And then he also was produced Dominator's Rebel Air. So, and he's produced other winners out of other maidens. And so his production record is pretty good and is passed on. I mean, and a lot of people talk about Fun Seeker Rebel. But I also tell people, I says, you guys talk about him, and he was a great dog. But you got to remember that female was part of it too. And she was a great female. And Fred DeLeo saw that himself. And he knew how great those dogs were going to be. And that's why he wanted the puppy. And he passed away before he got his puppy. So, I mean, now it's carried on. And I love to see Jamie Daniels, Tommy Rice, Brian Sanchez, everybody winning with dogs that go back to Scooter. And, yeah. Uh, and, I mean, I still, I still got frozen semen on him. And we use it some, not a lot. And his litters of frozen semen puppies are average of eight to nine puppies every time we do it. So I'm very happy with that. And I like what I see in his young dogs coming up. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I know that, uh, yeah, scooters had a big, a big impact on these dogs. Yeah. You know, like you said, you know, Jamie's kennel and, and Tommy Rice's and a number of other, you know, amateurs and pros that, that have been winning with those, those, you know, what we, I guess those rebel dogs, but coming right through scooters. So, um, yeah, that's, right. that's, and, and if uh, Riverton's black IP, that was a dog you bred also, you, you raised her. No, she was bred by a man here in Idaho. Oh, okay. In Eastern Idaho. And, yeah. And uh, so Matt Coverdale owned her. And Matt was new to the the porno world. He had, had went to a few club trials. And, and uh, so he, through another friend, he came over to the ranch and brought her. And uh, he turned her loose and he says, we ran her for a while and he says, uh, what do you think? I said, well, I think she's got a lot of potential. And he says, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I think she's got a lot of potential. He said, well, what do you think she needs to do? I said, get broke. And he says, well, she is broke. I said, no, not what I call broke. <laughs> so uh -huh. that's how she came about. And she was, I mean, anybody that saw her on the prairie, they were just amazed. She could run. It'd be a hundred degrees and never bat an eye, not let up, you know, and just swing in there and point birds. And down in the Florida, I ran her at the Florida championship. She done phenomenal jobs there. And there was a few times that a lot of guys thought she should have been called back, but she didn't, but so be it, you know, but she could adapt to anything and she qualified for the aims and she got injured two weeks before the national and we had to pull her out. So she didn't get her chance to run at the Ames, but she was a phenomenal dog. And she, you know, she was bred to run. Yep. 
And did you only breed her the one time? Uh, no, we repeated that breeding twice. You did okay. And uh, so the second time around had some winners in it, but they didn't have, you know, I, I mean, I didn't, I got to keep one for a while, and then the guy, he couldn't go on with her, and I placed her on the prairie, and uh, she actually ended up in Judd Carlton's hands. Is where he okay. ended up with her. So, okay. But I mean, those dogs, there was a lot, there was dogs in there that could have won if they'd had the opportunity. Right. And like I said, the, the three litter mates all won. Yep. Oh, well, that's so awesome. That's, that's kind of where that went. So, I had another question here from Jim Reese, and I think this is, you know, these are some stories that are fun to hear about. But how did, how did you and Nick Thompson meet? Well, Nick Thompson and I are old friends. And so at the Ames Plantation, he was young and I was young. <laughs> he came there looking to shoe horses. And uh, he was standing around there. He was new. Nobody knew who he was. and So we kind of struck, struck up a conversation. And uh, I found out he was a horseshoer. And I said, well, I need some horses shod. So. I said, can you do them? He says, yeah. So he ended up doing them. Well, as time went by, he started, everybody else started using him at the trials. A little more time got by, he started hanging out at Larry Huffman's because he lived down the road. And uh, so he'd go with Larry when Larry was working dogs and try to figure out the dog game. And, and he was a hunter and stuff, but it was a different world. And so we got to hanging out a lot more together. So finally, I don't remember what dog it was or what trial it was. I said, Nick, you got to scout a dog for me. He says, I can't do that. I said, yeah, you can. He said, no, I can't. He said, I don't know what I'm doing. I said, that's all right. We'll work through it. And uh, so that's how he got his start helping Larry Huffman and I. And uh, he scouted some for Larry and then he scouted for me. And as times went on, he's become a phenomenal dog person, you know in high demand, but there's no better person than Nick Thompson. I mean, he is just as genuine as they come. And uh, I'm glad to call him as one of my very good friends. No, oh, that's great. Yeah. I, I guess I, yeah, I kind of, I guess that's would have answered a question I wouldn't have asked you, but, but you wonder how, uh, you know, how Nick got started scouting and doing, I mean, obviously he is one of the, the most sought after scouts. I, you know, when you get to that neck of the woods. So, uh, everybody has always said, you know, he just does a right. great job and he works his tail off and, you know, we'll do everything he can to, you know, to help and, and, you know, get a dog, you know, through that type. Right. Pattern, so. Well, I, I, I even now run the German short hairs. We run at Hell Creek, Mississippi. So two years ago, I called him up. I said, Nick, I'm going to be at Hell's Creek running the, German short hair invitational. I said, you got any trials to help Larry? And he says, what time? And I told him, he said, no. I said, then you're coming over here to helping me. And he laughed. He said, you know, I won't ever live this down. I said, that's all right. <laughs> so yeah, he's I, helped me the last two years there. Yeah. I remember seeing a picture with, with him styling a, a short hair up for you and you standing there at, uh, that must've been at hell Creek. So uh, that's, that's pretty cool. Correct. So tell me now. Uh, so now we look forward. Yep. Tell me now how we how we got from to the end of end of a. I I remember hearing the the comment that you were retiring. Um, it appears you failed at that. So uh, tell us kind of yes. where how we got to where we are today. Well, we. Uh, so I don't know. I think it's been seven years, maybe eight. I lose track of time. Sold the ranch to the Richardsons, Keith and Bobby Richardson. And they bought it for a place to work dogs. And uh, so I said, oh, I'll still watch it for you. And I was still trialing. Well, a couple of years went by and they approached me and they said, how would you like to become a full time manager of the ranch? and quit trialing. I said, well, it's been in the back of my mind quite frequent. I said, 
it's getting harder. I'm getting older and I miss a lot of my children's life. Uh, knock on wood, I've been very fortunate to have a great woman, Penny, for my wife that took care of me living on the road and took care of the children. And I looked up and I saw my grandchildren almost grown. And I'm like, life is going by. You need to do something. And so I took the job as a full time job as manager. So that was all good. My wife quit work. We were enjoying life. And uh, I think three years went by and uh, the Richardsons had a change in their training program. And I said, uh, don't worry, I'll help you out till you get somebody else new. Well, now we're three years into it. <laughs> and so that's where that's at. But I told them I would not do it unless my wife would not agree to go with me. I would not do it. But if she agrees to go with me, I'll do it. I said, we spent a whole life apart and I'm not doing that no more. And so we travel, compete in their German short hairs. They are super people to work for. And uh, so I, and that's where I'm at now. And I enjoy it. You know, I enjoy it. I, everybody says, well, what's the difference? I said, they're a bird dog. There is no difference. I said, if you enjoy bird dogs, you will adapt to whatever. And so, you know, it was a change somewhat for me. It was a, and I told Keith and Bobby, I said, be patient. You probably won't agree with my training methods, but see what the outcome is. And so it's been very good. We've won a lot in the short time with our dogs all around the country. And, uh, so, I mean, that's where they're at. And everybody keeps asking me, the young pros ask me, how much longer are you going to do this? I said, I don't know. I says, I guess as long as Keith wants to do it, I'll do it. So I said, well, so Keith and I, we laughed this fall. We was having a conversation and he says, Rich, he said, you and I are going to walk out of here together. <laughs> I said, all right. I said, is that coming anytime soon? And he got quiet. He looked at me and grinned. And he says, what do you mean by that? I said, I'm just trying to plan my life. <laughs> so <laughs> we laugh. You know, we laugh about it. But I enjoy it. My, they're good people to work for. Very good people. And they're great for the bird dog world. I don't care what breed it is. They are great for the bird dog world. And, and a lot of people that know them now, they all agree with that also. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard great stuff. Um, so tell me a little how your schedule goes. So I train right here at the ranch all summer long. And uh, we start the 1st of September in Baker, Montana. And we run there. We're there for about a week or so. And then we go from there to uh, Nebraska, to the Sand Hills, and run there. That lasts about seven days. And then we go to Cheyenne, Wyoming, to their home place, and they have trials there. And we're there for almost two weeks because they have a whole slate of trials. I go home for two weeks and then back to the ranch with the dogs and train. And then I leave and go drive all the way to Maryland and compete in Maryland. And then I come home for two weeks. And I turn around and I go back to Missouri to Larry Smith's and compete there for the shooting dog invitation. And then I come back home again and uh, train a little bit. And then I leave right after Christmas and I go to uh, Mississippi and then I go to Ardmore, Oklahoma. And then I come home and then I take the month of February off. And then we start back up the first of March. And our first trial is that we run in is national at Grove Springs, Missouri. And then we get done with there, hot foot at home and start here in Idaho. And we wrap up here the first of May. So that's kind of the, everybody yep. says, I thought you slowed down. I said, no, I really haven't. No. <laughs> so last yeah. year I probably in that state of time, I put 50,000 miles on a rig driving. Yep. So, uh, so you mentioned that you go to, uh, Grove or to Larry Smith and run the shooting dog invitational. Now, are these all, uh, NG, uh, 
SPA trials that you're running? SPA. In? Yep. Correct. Okay. Right. And some of them, some of them are dual, dual region with AKC and that. So okay. some of the trials were required to retrieve in. So okay. Okay. In, in trials. And are you running? Yeah. I, I think you already answered the question, uh, but you're running both open or both uh, shooting dogs and all edge dogs in the with the short hairs. Correct. Their main focus is all age. And that's is. their love. The Richardsons, age, is. which for me, yes, that's their love is all age dogs. Okay. They have a few shooting dogs, but their love is all age, so it's fitting with me. You know, I that's what I like. And uh, so I showed them the type of all age dogs that I ran and what we should be looking for. And we're all in agreement now, you know, this is what we should be looking for. And that an all age dog can run big, but he still needs to come and go with you and pay attention to where you're at and, you know, find birds. So, it, it, you know, it's been a great education for them to see my world changed over to their world and I, and I th think they understand it and they like it. And, you know, the people around the, the trials now at first they was a little reluctant, but now they're accepted me and they all say, wow, we enjoy the type of dog you put down on the ground now. So that's, that's what it should be about. Yeah. So, and I've, I've kind of heard some of these statements before, you know, right. Uh, where people from, you know, and I don't, you know, maybe from another breed and, and I'll just say short ears, but maybe it's fishless or maybe it's, uh, something else. And they'll go to a, uh, you know, American field pointer trial. Let's call it the pointer trial. Cause that's, that's what they end up getting called. But, um, and they see, the all age dogs run and they say, geez, those, they, our dogs are running bigger than that, you know? And, uh, right. now are you seeing a, is that kind of what you were hearing? And then you're seeing a difference like, Hey, uh, you know, an all age dog is more than just being a, it's not all just range, right? It's, it's the full package. And is that kind of the changes that you've seen Correct. that you've got, you've been making? Yeah, I think, you know, that's part of it, you know, you know, a dog that rolls through the front and run, runs big and yeah. comes and goes with you, but lays out there, you know, yeah. and I think that's where some of the people seem to change, you know, and what's been good because a lot of the people from the American field has judged some of the short hair trials in all age state. And they said, wow, I never expected these short hairs to run like this. You know, so <laughs> it's been kind of an eye opener to a few people too. I said, oh, yeah, they can run. But, you know, it's a different – There, everybody asks me, is there a difference between pointers and setters and trigger short hair? Yeah, there is. I mean, they're physically different types, you know. But there's some German short hairs that are just phenomenal on the ground and can run big and run through the country, you know. And uh, so, you know, the Richardsons, they like – they have their line of dogs that they breed. They breed all their dogs, and and that's what they want to do. And uh, so, you know, it's fun to be part of that program with them. Yeah, I bet it is. Uh, is on the short hair side, is there any endurance sticks that you're running in that are, you know, more than oh, yeah. an hour, that are, you yeah, know, 90 our, minutes or two our, hours? Our, our, right. Two years ago, they started the all-age invitational there at Elk Creek. So uh, Keith built the format for it and got a lot of input from different people and not just in the short hair world from everybody. So there we run one hour, one day, one hour, the next day. And then what they call back has to come back for an hour and a half. Okay. That's the only true endurance stake in their sport. And that separates the big separation and that's that's what he wanted to do and uh that's the goal and at first a lot of people were a little reluctant but now they see if you're going to look for an all-age dog that's where you need to look for one because that's where you're going to get them so that that's their true endurance state 
Yeah, that's what. Yeah, that you know, that's one of the things that should separate the all age dogs, right, from the shooting dogs or the, or if you're on the AKC side, the gun dogs. Um, and so I think that's important. I think that uh, all the I've had that discussion, you know, over the years with a, a you know a fair number of you know of guys from different breed clubs, and I I think that is important. So, right. So uh, now what are, you go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So I was, rent- just gonna say, go, I was just going to say that, you know, all breeds should set their goals up high for a breeding program and, and produce good quality dogs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, at the ranch these days, what do you what what's keeping you busy? What are you doing? You're not obviously you're not trialing right now, uh, but you're uh, I assume working dogs, working puppies, uh, you know, getting dogs you know ready for the for the next season. Well, we kind of take May and June off because okay. it's nesting season. And leave the birds alone yeah. because we're wild birds. So right now is the ranch is getting it ready for training, habitat, planning, farming, irrigation. That's what my day does all day long. So, and, you know, we have 3,300 acres, so I have a lot to take care of. And, yeah, I bet uh, you do. But our, their focus, their focus on this ranch is strictly for wildlife and uh and that's their main goal and they've built a phenomenal facility here for field trials everybody's welcome here any breed we have rv parking we have horse pens we have a five thousand square foot clubhouse with master suites upstairs we have a, a five bedroom house for a guest house for field trial people it you know so we're always doing updates and it and it's open to the field trial world for anybody to ever want to run a trial here. And, uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's great to watch the change, you know, like I tell them, I said, it's still home to me, but you own it. I said, it's still my home. And they said, that's the way we want it. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I obviously you're blessed to have a, a long life with, with running bird dogs and, and doing a, a lot of it in that country right there. And, and a great opportunity that you have today. Right. You know, every, I've been asked by a lot of people, if you could live anywhere, where would you live? I said, still right here in Idaho. I said, no, I've been to a lot of great places, but I love it here. You know, I like yeah. the wide open space and the wild birds. Yeah, I can, I can believe that. Hey, we got, we got uh, one of our, you know, good friends here made a comment that I thought that we better, better put up here. Uh, Jamie Daniels. Uh, and, and, you know, these are, these are the kind of comments that come in all day long. Right. Uh, Jamie says one of the greatest men I've ever known, pay attention. One of the great, in my mind, one of the greats. So uh, I think that's, that's, you know, pretty well uh, respected uh, around the country. Uh, you know, Richie's built friendships, uh, all over the country, uh, from every direction. So, uh, that's, you know, well, well, well well-deserved comment there from Jamie. Well, it's been great to watch young men like Jamie and Judd and Tommy. I've watched them all develop into great dog people. You know, it's, it's been fun to watch that, you know, and be part of their life too. You know, it's uh, in the bird dog world, world, you have friendships that don't ever go away and, and that's what it should be. I mean, it's a common bond between us all. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, it's, it's, it's nice that those guys are on and and they're not afraid to say something, you know? So, uh, we're not going to go for a whole lot longer, but I do want to get some of your ideas. Uh, this is a sport that, you know, is not a secret. We talk about it every week that is not growing as fast as we'd like to. Uh, what do we what do we need to do to uh, continue the sport to grow 
and and build momentum in that respect here in the future? Well, I think we got to step back a little bit and look at the past. And this is my thoughts. We, somehow we got away from fun trials, club trials, weekend trials to bring new people in. And that's where everybody gets a start. And it needs to be cheap entries to get people to come. The pros need to come there and be there to help them and talk to them and, and explain things to them and, and be part of this. And I grew up as a kid running those little club trials. I can tell you today, you look around, you can't hardly find one anywhere. And uh, those memories stay with you forever. And that's how I got new owners. We had, we'd we have little club trials out here, but I would spend time hunting with those hunters and then slowly well, we'll bring them into the field trial world. And we got to look at that big picture. We got to, I know today's hunting for most people is hard because there's no places left to hunt anymore. But if we all take a little time and try to bring a new person in, you never know. That one new person may bring another new person in. And, you know, a prime example is Keith Wright. Paul Wright took the time and brought him in. And look what he's done. And look who he's brought on through his program. And, uh, you know, I've known Paul forever, too, you know. And uh, that's what we all got to do. We all got to take time and out and help somebody. Just bring them in, you know, and go spend time with them and, and do that. And I think that's the future. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, perfect sense. That being said, give me a little bit of, uh, uh, what am I thinking? Oh, just a, the state of field trial on the way in, in the West. I think there will be, but the field trial in the West is going to be hard because of there's no pros out here anymore. And a lot of it is it's hard to get somebody to support a pro. You know, most of the amateurs will put a, put a dog with a pro and just leave it for a little bit and then take it home. In order for the trials to grow, you've got to support a pro. Everybody's got to support a pro. Uh, Tommy Smedley from Utah is a young man that I he bought his first bird dog from us at 19 years old, and that was T's Gunrunner. And uh, so he went through his career. He became a, a reigning horse trainer, a very successful reigning horse trainer, went through that, and now he's training dogs. And I still – I talk to him on a regular basis and help him, but – you know, he's he tried to want to build a string of field trial dogs, and he says, I can't do it because nobody wants to leave them with me. So it takes commitment from the amateurs also to support a pro, and that's not going to happen out here on the West Coast. And if they keep it up, there won't be no real trials. There'll be always be trials, but not the trials of the, where the pros are anymore. It'll be all amateur. Okay. Yeah, I was kind of curious. We're, you know, I, I obviously the you know we see trials happening out there all the time. It's a it's a part of the country I haven't gotten to, to for field trials, but I I surely have it on my list. So uh, I hope I, I hope I can get out there soon. Um, well, any last words that you want to share with everybody, Rich? I I really appreciate appreciate you coming on. I think this has been super informative. I think these are stories about these. Uh, some of the dogs of the past and, and just the knowledge that you've had uh, and the, the great, you know, knowledge you've, you've gained, you know, going from, from uh, the all age uh, major circuit, all age with pointers and setters and, and moving on over to the, to the short hair ranks and having showing that, you know, you're, you're going to have success either side. And that's just, you know, more than likely just an effort of, you know, hard work and, and putting the knowledge that you've, you've gained over the years together. Well, I think my last word to be is that we all need to be together in the sporting world. I don't care what it is. We need to help each other. And uh, 
always keep your door open and you never know who that new person is going to come in that can do things down the road and can help the sport. And uh, I mean, in my life, I've met a lot of great people and have a lot of good friends and the dog world has been great to me. And I think if we, we all go out there and go hunting and be with people we like to enjoy the outdoors with, that's the future of this whole sport. Yep. I couldn't say it any better. I, I, I say it all the time. We've got all the things that everybody wants. We've got outside, we've got a uh, beautiful country. We've got bird dogs. Uh, you know, we've, we're, we're shooting guns. We've got all kinds of stuff and horses. Uh, there's, there's, there's no reason why this sport shouldn't continue to, to move forward and grow, uh, because we have so much to offer. So, uh, as, as well as the great people like, like Richie and, uh, you know, so many other guys that we've talked about tonight. And so, uh, you know, just keep spreading the word and invite new people. If you see a new person at a trial, you know, just like, just like you did with, with Nick Thompson, you know, stick your hand out and, 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 uh, you know, make a friend and, you know, you just don't know what you're going to develop into in the future. So, uh, I think that's a, that's a pretty good way to end the show. Uh, once again, Rich, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, everybody else remember, uh, share this out there, share it on YouTube, share it on Facebook. Uh, make sure these things are, are getting seen. Uh, and, and if you like what we're doing, I I'm here, you know, obviously I'm hearing a lot of great comments from all over the country of people enjoying the show. So we're going to keep doing them. Uh, I do them because I like to talk about bird dogs and I like to talk about the, you know, friends like, like Richie and, and glean a little bit of knowledge and, and get some history that, you know, we can get recorded to, you know, stay here for all time. So, uh, everybody, you know, have a great night. Uh, have a super weekend. We'll, uh, we'll try to be back next week with another show. I, obviously we had two this week, but we missed last week. Uh, everybody gets busy this, this time of year here in, in farm country. So, uh, hopefully next week we'll be back with another great show. Rich, thanks for coming on. And uh, everybody have a great night. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. You keep up the good work. This is great. Thanks.